Welcome to The Riff, where writer and investor Bern Hobart and I discuss the major inflection points caused by technological change. Our weekly conversation covers the obvious and not so obvious ways in which markets and businesses will adapt as a result. Let's jump right in. Let's start by talking about M&A. Why do acquisitive companies have a negative reputation with, with investors? Yeah, yeah. So lots of reasons to think that acquisitions are a terrible idea and you should sell shares of any company that tries to do a big one. We've got one, just like there's there's the usual winner's curse thing going on. So in any kind of auction, the winner is whoever's willing to pay the most. There that may be that the winner is like the most sophisticated and the only one to recognize the value. But a pretty good reason for that to happen is that the winner just overestimates things. And, and that's why they end up owning the company. And that is actually, I, I think that the you know winner's curse, like people talk about it in auctions, but it actually shows up in a lot of other places. And one of the places that people don't recognize it as much is in scheduling and in specifically why complex projects tend to fall behind schedule and why it's really hard to measure, why it's really hard to accurately predict how long they'll take. It is actually an instance of winner's curse that if you are trying to do such a project, it's because you think that you are able to do it. Other people have probably considered such a thing. They have decided not to do it. And so you're probably just the most pathologically optimistic. Like you you may be right and big projects do actually get done and some of them get done ahead of schedule. But I think it's the same kind of dynamic that if you are the winner in some kind of competition, there are just many axes on which you can compete. And in this case, it is just, it's literally a competition for who has, among other things, it can be a competition for who has the biggest ego about their own ability to turn around some acquisition or to see the value in, in some company. So that's that's one piece. Another piece is kind of in the microeconomics of bidding for a company. It, like typically companies, like a lot of M&A deals, they happen because a company got shopped around. Either, you know, explicitly they hired a banker and told the banker, please help us sell. Or just implicitly, like people start to realize this company is probably going to get acquired and they start having conversations. And depending on the tenor of those conversations, you can sometimes infer that there are other bidders in the mix. And what happens there is that there is a sunk cost to just evaluating a company for purchase. You know, you are building financial models. You might be hiring a banker. You're certainly spending time on the deal. And because of that, once you have decided that this company is worth acquiring for yeah, whatever, a billion dollars, if it turns out there's a higher bidder and they're bidding a little bit more, you might feel like you're, you are waste, you, you know, you've wasted this time on it already and spending an incremental 20 million, 50 million, et cetera, is still worth it. And that's, that is, you know, some cost fallacy is called a fallacy as it is a fallacy. Like the, the amount of effort you expended in the past doesn't really matter. What matters is what is the marginal benefit of the next unit of effort or the next you know, reasonable chunk of effort. But I think that is another feature. Um, one, which is one that um, Warren Buffett talks about a lot in his, or has talked about in some of his shareholder letters is just that um, executive pay is partly a function of company size. It's just, it's really hard to be paid millions of dollars to run a company that makes, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars. It's pretty hard not to make millions of dollars running a company that is near the top of the Fortune 500. There is just this incentive where all else being equal, CEOs do want to run larger organizations because they get paid more. And it's also just cooler to run a big company. So they're bragging rights as well. I think that that part is probably less true than it used to be because compensation has moved so much towards equity comp. So still the size of the options grant is going to be a function of the size of the company. But um the the rewards from doing well are much more skewed towards did you do a good job with what you had versus did you just expand the company regardless of whether or not it was the best thing for shareholders. And then the last thing is just mergers have transaction costs. Like the, the cost to buy a company is higher than the cost of that company's stock on the open market almost all the time. This is also, it's also true that if you are a buyer and you reach out to a company that probably they they consider rationing up the valuation at which they would sell even if there isn't a quoted market for the stock price you know for the stock or for the value of the company so yeah just lots of lot there are lots of different ways that things can lean towards people paying a bit too much for acquisitions and and it seems like there's not a great mechanism for preventing that but there was a recent report that Bain put out where they looked at just investment, like the returns on returns to shareholders for investing in companies that do no acquisitions or a few acquisitions or more than one acquisition a year and found that there is this steady increase in returns that the more acquisitive the company is, the higher the returns are. 
Um, and the first thing to say about that is there is, of course, a selection effect. So um, you know, WeWork was buying a lot of companies when it was big and growing and investors were shoveling money into it and its valuation was going up. Um, didn't do as many acquisitions on the way down. So you do have this selection effect of when companies are dying, they're not buying. And depending on how you slice the terms, you know, if you if you look at returns over the last 10 years and compare that to acquisitions, you're basically selecting for companies that survived over the last 10 years and, and you know, that were profitable enough to be acquisitive in that time. Whereas if you look at forward returns, conditioning on prior acquisitions, you might get different results. But it is also true that just if you look anecdotally at, at the stock price reaction to merger announcements, it's not always the case that the acquirer stock goes down. Um, which was historically, it was historically true that the the target goes up, acquirer goes down, and that's what everyone expected. But there are times when the market just really likes a deal and the stock pops, you know, not massively, but it goes up a little bit. And I think there are a couple of cases you can make for for why, why that would be. And what they tie into is um, there's this observation I've made um, in a while ago in the diff that it used there are fewer diamonds in the rough there are fewer cases where you can find this really exceptionally managed small company with great economics and a cheap stock price um you usually get to pick among those but it's hard to find all of them at once but if you read about um some of the the great um growth investors and value investors of the mid 20th century they find these kinds of great companies all the time. Like they find companies where the manager is phenomenal, the, the economics of the business are great, the company's growing, it's spending its cash intelligently, et cetera. Um, my guess is just the market and talent has gotten a lot more efficient, that a lot more people who would have just ended up at some local company and then would have moved up the ranks and ended up running it. Like a lot of them are going to more elite schools. They're immediately getting shuffled into large elite companies. And so the people who do just, you know, their first job is at a local business in their hometown and they move up the ranks. They're just, they're not as good that there's been some selection at the top. Um, and you can kind of take advantage of that by just finding cases where there is actually a really good reason that someone would have wanted to take a job in their hometown and continue working at a local company. Um, so like I would say the, the Utah tech ecosystem is kind of like that, that people who are born in Utah, who are Mormons, they, they would actually prefer to live in a more Mormon part of the country, and they just don't have a lot of options outside of Utah. So you actually end up with a lot more of like a normal distribution of talent, a lot more people who, yeah, they could have gotten the McKinsey job, they could have gone to work for Facebook, but they also want to actually stay closer to Salt Lake City. So they, they stay there, work at a local tech company there, and those companies do tend to punch above their weight in, in many respects. Uh, so that's that is like that's that's a thing that's going on, and you know for that to be true, it just has to be the case that either the talent is going somewhere or the good companies are going somewhere. And I think the answer to where the good company is going, and actually the answer to some of where the talent is going, is private equity. That PE firms, you know, they they can buy a company that is just really cheap and then sell it at a reasonable price, but it's a lot. Their model works a lot better if it's like. You buy a company that's growing reasonably fast, you make sure that capital is not a constraint on their growth, they grow really fast for a while, and then you and you also you know, keep an eye on, on their uh, their cost structure and things, and then you can take it public at a nice premium to where you bought it. Um, and if that's the case, then what you could say is that if a lot of the deals that are kind of financially good deals on a standalone basis, if those deals are being taken, those companies are no longer active merger targets because somebody just bought them, then what's left are the companies where they're not great on a standalone basis, but they could make a lot of sense strategically. So if the PE buyer is not a strategic buyer, but some other company is a strategic buyer, that company can actually pay more for some businesses. And, um, and then, you know, it's, it's fine to be the high bidder if you actually get more value out of the company you acquire than somebody else. So, um, you know, there is like, even though plenty of people know that the winner's curse exists, it's not like no one has ever participated in an auction after hearing about this. Like sometimes you just realize that, yeah, I'm biased in this direction. On the other hand, when I run the numbers, things do look pretty good. So I'm going to participate anyway. So I think that is, um, that's part of what's going on. I think another piece is just, um, Companies that are in the in any kind of manufacturing and actually in retail too, they've gotten a lot better at modeling their supply chains. They have to know what's going on, not just at their suppliers, but their supplier suppliers and so on. Because you really you don't want to be in a situation where your Toyota you can't make a car because the supplier to the supplier to the supplier to the supplier to the company that sells you. I don't know, the seatbelts or like the navigation, you know, computer or whatever, like something went wrong way deep in the supply chain. So they've gotten better at modeling pretty deep into that supply chain. And when they do that, they can start to identify cases where there is some kind of 
monopolistic supplier has really high margins and it would just be very strategically bad to let that company fall into the hands of a competitor. On the other hand, it would be very valuable to own this high margin business where you do actually control what the ultimate demand for the product is. So I think that those kinds of deals also bump up the returns for serial acquirers. And one last piece is, or two last pieces, one Way more CEOs or more CEOs are pretty technical, and a lot of the big tech companies are quite acquisitive. And those CEOs have to be very good at evaluating technical talent. That is, it's just really hard to run a very large tech company if you aren't pretty good at evaluating who's going to make it. You know, who's going to be a good engineer? So they can actually get more value out of strategic acquisitions because they can they can find and evaluate the talent a bit better. And related to that, um, a lot of the big um, online platform companies, they just have a huge surface area for tracking data. So, you know, I'm, I'm recording this through something in Chrome. That means Google can tell who has market share in podcast, in web-based podcast recording software. They can tell who has higher engagement, what the churn rate looks like, et cetera. So they're in a really good position if they're evaluating companies in that space to know more than anyone about which company they should be acquiring if they want to acquire one. So I think all of that adds up to a pretty good case that M&A is actually a, a better idea than it used to be, but only for these really specific and very hard to execute reasons. So it's like anyone who reads this and like that is what changes their mind and they say M&A is fine. Um, they probably shouldn't be pushing for mergers, but you can kind of look at that and say, okay, the, the things that I'm seeing, which are, you know, my company is large enough to know what's going on in, in the broader ecosystem it interacts with. And also the people at top are pretty good at understanding who is, um, who is, you know, sandbagging, who is bragging, who is just honestly telling a very impressive truth. And um, so, yeah, it does, it does kind of make sense that some of these serial acquirers would actually be doing quite well. We'll get back to the conversation in a moment after a word from our sponsors. Over 100 startups launched today. Do you know who they are? If you're not seeing interesting startups, none of your downstream processes matter. How you source deals at the earliest stages could be your most consequential investment. Harmonic is the most complete startup database, finding new companies as soon as they incorporate and tracking them through IPO. You can create a search tailored to your investment thesis. In one search, filter over company data, including venture stage, industry, and geography, founders and operators' backgrounds, and traction metrics like headcount changes, social media audience, and web traffic growth. Importantly, Harmonic instantly surfaces warm connections to help you connect with founders. The results are delivered on autopilot, wherever you most need them, over Slack, email, or via API, directly into your CRM, integrating seamlessly into your software stack. Learn why Craft, Bedrock, NEA, and hundreds more. Trust Harmonic's data by visiting harmonic.ai or use the link in the description. Make sure you mention our podcast, Turpentine VC, during your demo. Hey everyone, Eric here. At Turpentine, we're building the first media outlet for tech people by tech people. We're the network behind the show you're listening to right now. We have a slate of hit shows across a range of topics and industries, from our AI and investing cluster of podcasts to shows that drive the conversation in tech with the most interesting thinkers, founders, investors, and influencers, like Econ 102 with Noah Smith. We're launching new shows every week, and we're looking for industry-leading sponsors. If you think that might be you and your company, email me at erikaturpentine.co. That's E-R-I-K at turpentine.co, and let's partner together. It's interesting, uh, the opposite of the auctions curse. I was just watching this uh, Peter Thiel interview with Ann Coulter about uh, Gawker and how um, he was sort of saying almost the opposite of like, there's these actions that you could take that you assume that everyone else is taking. And because of that, you don't do it. Uh, but actually, more, more people just don't do it because they don't they think that everyone else is, is not doing it um, because uh, or they think that everyone else is doing it. That's why they're not doing it. But actually, no one is doing it. Um, and if you just are a little proactive, you, you can make things happen. Yeah. Yeah. I think that is definitely the case. There is, um, I'm blanking on the name of the blog post. There's a really good blog post on just doing the reading and on how if you read the books in that everyone in your field says are the canonical books in that field, you're actually probably ahead of a lot of people. And a lot of people will kind of reflexively recommend something, even though it is not. Um, 
it's not necessarily something they've read or not something they've read all the way through. Like, I guess like the Feynman lectures on physics are kind of an example where there are just a, a lot of um, copies of those books on shelves where the, uh, the, the spine on volumes two and three is, is totally pristine. And, you know, on, on volume one, the underlining stop like 20 pages in. Um, so yeah, it is, it is the case that, yeah, sometimes people just don't do, um, they don't necessarily do the work. And also that if you are, um, if you do actually read the source material or you check some of the footnotes and see if the footnote, you know, if the, if the source actually says what this summary says that it says, um, or just you do the math, you know, if someone says, I, I don't know, whatever, whatever, like there's that, this crazy stat on, um, how house cats kill just a ridiculous number of birds every year. And it turns out there's like one academic who just doesn't like cats very much and posts these completely insane estimates of just what a, you know, what a constant slaughterhouse the average suburban backyard is. If they have an outdoor cat, it's, it's probably not true. So yeah, sometimes like doing the math and doing some kind of basic sanity check of, is it even remotely possible that this claim is accurate? Um, it, it's a comparative advantage. Actually, had this happen um, on Twitter the other day because someone was tweeting about how America is um, just a few corporations in a trench coat, and um, I was thinking about that. The first thing that occurred to me was like, "There's um, so there's this book about Samsung. I think I think it was published as Samsung Rising in the U.S. I think it was um, I think it was going to be called Republic of Samsung um, in other markets, or that was the original working title. And the thrust of the book is like, Samsung is the Korean economy. It is a it's something like 20% of exports. It's a huge employer. They're very tied in with the government. And even though they're not all of the econ- they're not literally all of the economy, like a lot of the economy is Samsung or suppliers to Samsung or people who sell goods and services to people who work at Samsung or one of those suppliers. So I thought, I don't know if the U.S. is actually more dominated by large companies than than other countries are. And when I looked it up, I used the, the very simple proxy of just largest company in the country, like revenue of the largest company in the country divided by GDP. And you get this very, very high level measure of just how big is the biggest company compared to the other companies in that country. And it turns out the U S like of the spot checks I did, like the U S actually has a comparatively small kind of puny, um, puny, like enormous corporate sector. Um, like our biggest companies are very big in a global sense, but the U S is like a quarter of the world's GDP in a relative sense. Um, Volkswagen is, you know, a larger piece of the German economy and, uh, Volvo is a larger piece of the Swedish economy. Um, and there's a big Canadian oil company that is a larger piece of their economy. Like there, you know, it may be true that the U.S. U.S. companies punch above their weight in terms of lobbying. But I think that's like that itself would be a really interesting story of why is it that Walmart, if Walmart does actually have more, you know, more lobbying prowess than, than Volkswagen, like how are they so much better at this than other big multinationals? And especially like, how are they so much better at this than companies in countries where that were just a lot more friendly to uh, corporate bribery for a long time. And that have this sort of um, like the, the German unemployment system is kind of, it's not like designed on behalf of corporations. Like it's good for the workers too, but the German unemployment policy is that it, it, it kind of leans towards this idea of you shouldn't actually switch employers because you got laid off in a recession. Instead, you should work a little bit less. The dividend should go down. Like everyone tightens their belts a bit, but you do keep your job. And that means that you keep your skills. And that means that the company actually has this big incentive to invest in your training. So if you're going to be a lifer at some company, they can spend the first five years of your career just teaching you how to do valuable things. Um, and that's, you know, that's, that, that is a system where in some sense, maybe the company is less influential because it's tied into this complicated ecosystem, but maybe it's more influential because if there is a, an unemployment system like that, that encourages people to stick around, that's, uh, that's very much um, in line with the company's model. But anyway, this is like, you know, it, it was kind of a throwaway thing, but it, it doesn't take very long sometimes to just check the numbers and see like, is this directionally true? Like, is it, is it more true of America than of other places? Or is it actually like, it seems true because America has some huge, huge companies, but um, if you just look at the amount of economic activity that runs through a given company and compare it to the size of that company's host country, um, actually America looks like a more decentralized, fragmented economy than much of the rest of the world. And that's really more true in some places. Like in, in banking, we have a very, very decentralized banking system compared to much of the rest of the world where it's like a handful of huge banks and then not much else. Part of the reason that American banking is so fragmented is there's this long, weird political history of um, 
sometimes sometimes different states being very anti-banking they're very suspicious because usually the money from banking comes from the east coast comes from new york and so it's there's like this carpet bagging dynamic to bankers coming into town and people will feel like the the fruits of their labor are going to the mortgage and the mortgage is going to investors back east so there was there was some antipathy to banking in a lot of local regulations, but there's also antipathy to, to banking like large size banks. And so a lot of places had a system where your bank has one branch. It can have one branch in one place and that's it. That is your bank. It's this one building and all the economic activity has to be associated with that one place. And that um that that does just create this artificially very very decentralized banking system and um and then once you have these local businesses that are actually um you know after after a couple of generations they're mostly owned by the locals they have very close ties to the community at that point then the political pressure is like we don't want a chase in our town we already have a bank and people we know and like who you know gave us the mortgage for our first home or lent us money for the small business we started that we we still run like those people will probably lose out if this larger company with more resources shows up so there was um, some pressure to keep like one when, when it became more feasible to have a bank with multiple branches in multiple states there was still some some level of protectionism but that is that is slowly unwinding in part because um Small banks are, they just can't be as efficient as large banks. Banking is at some level a numbers game. Just the more loans you have in your, um, in your portfolio, the less likely it is that any one default becomes a big problem for your bank. And then banking in some ways is, um, is more centralized than it looks because the small banks just don't have the resources to write their own internal software. So a lot of them are using software from the same handful of companies. So in a sense, our banking system is like a couple large companies that can actually do the full stack. And then this um, long tail of basically franchise operations of a few providers of um, very expensive and not especially good financial software. Yeah, that, that, that makes sense. I, I want to segue to one of your other pieces that you you, you talked about. You you talked about Amazon and their unions. Can you talk about what's yes. uh, what's happening there? Why is that interesting? Yeah, yeah. So um, one of my one of my theories of unions is that a a thing to keep in mind with unions is that they do like they are you know potentially creating wealth. They're definitely transferring, trying to transfer some wealth from from the company from the employer to the employees. And, you know, the employer is, of course, trying really hard to transfer wealth from the employees to themselves. So, um, you know, all, all is all is fair in, in, in love, war and business. But um, what one of the differences is that if you are at a company and you make some decision that has a cost right now and then pays off very well over time, that gets capitalized. That gets reflected in the value of the business. And so if you make one of those decisions and, you know, you can make a plausible case that this is a, a good investment, even though it's costly right now, your stock price goes up. Uh, if a union does the same thing where they do something that is costly right now, but has benefits in the future, they've got two problems. One of which is the future workers are not necessarily the current workers. And so if you work really, really, you know, you, you sacrifice today in order to ensure that Amazon workers 20 years from now are doing better and, you know, have easier access to health insurance and more breaks or whatever. Um, that is just, you know, it's, it's less appealing and you can't capitalize it. You can't like do something that is good for the future incomes of people with your job category and then, you know, sell, sell shares in Amazon, um, Amazon fulfillment center worker futures and use that to fund the fact that you were on strike and not getting paid for a while. And the other thing is just, um, it, I guess it's like related to that is that that means that unions should have a higher discount rate. Like they, they do care about what happens to workers right now. They just don't have as much of an interest and don't have like a, the institutional mechanics required to care about outcomes for future workers. But Amazon Amazon shareholders today care very deeply about what happens to Amazon's future shareholders because those future shareholders are the ones who are buying your shares of Amazon when you sell. So like you, when you are investing in a company, what you're ultimately doing is making this bet that future shareholders will be even more excited, even more optimistic about it than you are. And there's no way to make an analogous bet with unions. So Amazon is in a position to just wait people out. And um, that seems to be what they're doing. So the Amazon union, you know, it, um, got a lot of attention a year or two ago. They they had, you know, some victories, but now there's a lot of internal tension. They're running low on funds, um, haven't had any big wins recently. And 
I think at that point, Amazon can just keep on waiting. You know, if they're running low on funds and not achieving very much, then it's very hard for them to raise more funds. And if they have no money, it's very hard for them to accomplish anything. And so eventually it just kind of peters out. I think this is especially an especially strong case for Amazon because um, they do, they seem to have a, a lower um, required, like a lower corporate hurdle rate than pretty much anyone else in big tech. And I think maybe maybe a lower hurdle rate than just about anyone outside of real estate who is trying to max like is trying to invest at above their cost of capital is thinking about things in terms of return on investment and hurdle rates um they they do a lot of they make a lot of decisions where it's just very hard to see how that achieves the the same kind of returns that an asset light approach would achieve on the other hand it, those decisions like building fulfillment centers buying planes um their their various early investments in products that may or may not pan out. Um, a lot of that stuff does does eventually pay off and it can absorb a lot more capital. And like one one way to think about Amazon is that they are they are trying to build a business that they're trying to build future businesses that can absorb all of the capital they expect their current crop of successful businesses to throw off. So every year, you know, it's it, it gets um, a little bit more straightforward for AWS to keep growing, for Amazon retail to keep growing, for logistics to keep growing. Like these things can all return cash flow to the rest of Amazon. And then Amazon needs somewhere to put that cash flow because they just really don't they seem to just have this ideological view that um, other American businesses are not going to invest their capital as well as Amazon, that Amazon shareholders just really shouldn't be getting dividends. They, you know, there should be like, if there's a buyback, it should be like this minimal dilution offsetting thing, not like a huge source, a huge um, return of capital program to shareholders. Um, so Amazon does want, you know, the next big growth company that you'd invest your Amazon profits in to be a wholly owned subsidiary of Amazon. So Amazon can do that reinvesting for you. That, that makes sense. Uh, just because there's a few, few pieces there, I want to segue into your other one around what makes a, a great memo. Yeah, great memo. So I, uh, I I have strong views on this because I have worked at uh, companies of varying sizes and pretty much every, like almost every office job seems to be pretty much mediated by email. Like email, email is not necessarily where decisions get made, but it is where made decisions get articulated. And it is like the the record. When you are, when you're at a company and you're trying to figure out when did we do this? Why did we do this? You're usually searching your inbox. You're probably not searching Slack or something. Um, and so memos become important. And when, as a company, so if you have a small company where everyone can just talk, like you can overhear every conversation that's happening among your colleagues. You're probably CC'd on almost everything. Keeping track of what's going on is a pretty straightforward task. But as you, um, as the company grows, the number of potential connections between workers is going to grow at, um, it's not, it's not number of workers squared, but it's, you know, it, it's a super linear function. And what that means is that eventually the big barrier to scale becomes communication. It is, you know, someone, someone who is wiping the counter at McDonald's has some idea that idea could make McDonald's a lot of money if it ever gets to the CEO, but it probably doesn't get to the CEO. There's, it probably gets lost in translation somewhere along the way. And that ends up being just this, this limiting factor where companies just lose the ability to, 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 aggregate information effectively and get it to the right people. And the memo is how that is done. So um, my view on memos is that you pretty much want to write them for, for multiple audiences where the more important someone is, the more likely it is that they are just reading the subject line or just reading a handful of bullet points. Um, there are some companies where the CEOs are really avid readers. I think those companies do better, but it's also the case that CEOs are very busy. Um, there was that recent book, Private Equity, which talked about um, what it was like to work as um, Chase Coleman's assistant. And early on in that book, one of the data points that gets thrown out is that Coleman gets roughly 7,000 emails a day. And um, that was actually a while ago. So it's entirely possible that that number has gone way up. Um, so if you get 7,000 emails a day, um, if they are all six page Amazon memos with their 40 page appendices and charts, they're just not all getting read. But 6,000 subject lines, uh, 7,000 subject lines a day, that is actually, that's pretty doable. Um, if it's five words a subject line, that is like a novella, you know, a very, very lengthy New Yorker article, um, you know, a couple chapters from a book. Like that is, that is a doable thing for a person to read. Um, so if you're writing a memo to that is eventually going to be read by some very busy person, you have to assume you have to write it in such a way that the subject line gets the point across and that the high level summary tells them everything that they would care to know to make the decision. And then 
if you write um, such a memo, then you actually have the body of the memo where you articulate, here's what we're going to do, here's why, here are the trade-offs, here's where we got the data, here's a chart showing what has been happening, here's a chart showing what we think will happen, et cetera, et cetera. And so the question that comes up if you're trying to write this um, you know, really terse summary that says it all is like, why are you writing the rest of it too? And the answer is that to actually get to the summary that tells someone everything they need to know, you need to think in great detail about all of the all of the things they don't need to know, their inputs into the things they do need to know. Um, so I have this um, this idea of this hypothetical thought experiment where you know someone reads a memo proposing here here's a new marketing campaign we're going to do. It's a long memo. Somewhere on page nine, they find some little detail that tells them actually we should not do this campaign under any circumstances. So that that is a problem because whatever it was that was on page nine should have been in one of those leading bullet points. It should have been in the executive summary as a risk factor or an extra consideration or something like that. Um, but you really only notice that if you are, you know, writing something kind of structured, but long form that's informed by data, and then you're going back and trying to summarize it. And then you're looking at your summary, comparing it to the text again, and trying to ask yourself, okay, what what is missing from this summary? What's redundant in this summary? Like, how can I tighten this up as much as possible to make sure that the surprises are as small as possible? So that, that is really what you're trying to do. Is you're trying to, you, you have this long kind of discursive process of exploring a problem space and trying to understand all of the trade-offs involved. And then you turn that into this quick summary, but the real goal of that summary is to maximize surprise. It is, you know, the the viral tweet based on the long form article where the tweet gets more attention than the article ever did because the tweet sums up what is the most interesting thing here in a punchy way that people want to share. And you are, you know, if you're writing a memo within a large organization, you are actually gunning for a certain kind of vir virality. It's a very special kind of virality where you want it to go viral upward through the org chart, not viral outward through everybody. But you still care about virality. You still care Care about this getting to someone who is going to react well and someone who, um, you know, if they take action based on that memo and then six months later they're reviewing their decision, trying to understand where it came from, and they go back and review the memo, like you want the memo to hold up well, you want it to look like this is the, the output of a very structured, careful thought process from an informed person. And that, uh, that often takes a couple drafts. Uh, Turpatine just did its uh, its investor memo, uh, which I will share to you and to listeners of this podcast for uh, for for feedback. We're not actually raising money, but we are recruiting uh, talent, and we want people to be excited about what we're doing. And so we thought that would be the best way, as if we were pitching investors, to to get people excited. So we will see if we uh, we will take these memo uh, sort of feedback into consideration and. And uh, see what you think. Maybe uh, one episode we can get your your feedback on it as sort of a, a live uh, live chat. Yeah, yeah, that would that would actually be a fun uh, a fun one to do. Just a live you know discussion, tear down, etc. Of a memo, and I, I like that idea. I, I think I think sometimes doing things that are just like just a little bit larpy, but like larpy in a truth seeking direction can be yeah. really effective. Um, and this is actually something Amazon does where um, I'm not sure they do this for everything, but um, I know there, there've been a number of Amazon books that talk about them starting with the press release announcing the product and then working backwards to what can we do to make every part of this press release actually come true. And that is an iterative process. So maybe some really cool bullet point from the press release does not actually make it into the final version, but it does it does seem to work and it gives people something very concrete to work towards cool well i will uh i will get that for a, for a future episode we'll, we'll, we'll make it happen um I, I want to segue to something else you wrote about uh where you talked about how it's hard to make money with many ai services because the general purpose models are so good what why, why don't you explain that yeah so there have been a couple companies i mean there there's the whole gpt wrapper category which is is still happening and i think some of those companies can compete on distribution there are some special cases where um what they're doing does actually make sense but i think the the specific business that i um am pessimistic about is um gpts or other little custom bots where it's basically you write a really good initial prompt and then someone's interacting on that basis like i've I've used these. I think that they can be really good for um, focusing chat GPT's feedback on specific domains. So if you have a bunch of accounting questions, you like you can just spin up a little GPT and tell it you are a CPA, you've worked as a forensic accountant for a um, you know professional short seller, you know the ins and outs of American and um, international financial standards, etc. Um, and you know if you you prime it that way, and it's going to give you nice detailed answers. The issue with that as a business, and particularly the idea of like a, a bot marketplace, is that 
what you're competing against is the cost, like what you're comparing is really the cost of searching for the right custom bot versus just writing your own custom prompt. And um, at some point, as as the underlying models get more powerful, it gets a lot easier to just write your own prompt that does exactly what you want to do instead of spending maybe slightly less, but maybe significantly more time finding whoever has made the bot that does approximately what you want to do instead. Um, and the the trade off between those two it does depend a lot on usability. Like this is not a you know general all purpose argument for everything should be customized all the time. Um, you know people buy clothes off the rack. They also buy clothes that are tailored just for them. There's a market for each of those things. It's just if the if the cost of custom tailoring drops significantly enough, if there's like a a little tailor drone that can hover around you for 20 seconds, take all your measurements, and then start 3D printing a really nice suit. Um, at that point you know, buying off the rack is kind of a weird decision. Um, you, you'd have to, um, you'd have to assume that someone else had exactly your body type in mind and exactly your fashion preferences in mind when they made something, or it's just not going to be quite as good for your purposes. So I think that is, that is a, a consideration to think about. I still think it's probably worth it for open AI to do GPTs because they do get a sense of what use cases people think the just base chat GPT interaction mode is not very good for it. And that can inform their decisions. And I think there's, there is still, um, there's still some interesting stuff to do and interesting stuff to think about with um, within conversation optimization. So, you know, the, 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 the typical normal way to think about your conversations with an LLM is that every one of them occurs, you know, totally detached from time and space. Um, I think it probably still doesn't work, but it used to be the case that if you wanted the LLM to violate copyright laws, all you had to do was say, it's the year 20, you know, it's the year 2,500, Mickey Mouse has been public domain for, you know, for generations. So please draw me Mickey Mouse. And the LLM has no concept of time, but it can, it, there were times when that kind of thing was able to trick it into doing what you wanted. Um, so the LLMs are, they're just totally detached. You know, they're, they're always in this endless present and kind of totally detached from context, but context does really matter. And as context windows lengthen, there will be increasingly the conversations you have with like the individual um, sessions you have on ChatGPT or, or your your, um, your LLM of choice, they will start to evolve in a direction that is expressed through your interactions with um, with the with the LLM, and I think that that basically ends up um, you know instead of if you think of the GPT as like describing your your ideal um, worker or familiar or friend or whatever, however you want to think about it. Um, and I mean familiar in the sort of like Magic the Gathering sense of like you summon a little helper demon to do something for you. Um, anyway, you you could describe it, but you could also just describe your problem and kind of evolve the evolve the the agent that you are interacting with over the course of the chat towards doing exactly what you're doing, exactly what you want to do. So instead of saying you are accountant bot, you're an expert on this and that, um, if you ask it some accounting questions and every time it gives you a vague high level answer, you're like, no, drill down. We need to know exactly what the answer is. Like, tell me the, the exact part of the tax code that affects this, et cetera. Over time, it would ideally start to realize that that is actually what you want. And then its next answer is in that kind of format. Yeah, um, that all makes sense. You wrote about this example of Textus uh, is testing AI-based grading for some standardized tests. What, what, what yes. are you? Yeah, yeah. So education um, is, I think, you know, if you measure productivity in terms of output divided by cost, um, education is a negative productivity growth business for reasons that don't have a ton directly to do with teachers. It's just. Um, if there are other parts of the economy that are getting more efficient and you need a certain amount of headcount for teaching, you do have to raise their, their compensation over time um, just, to, just to stay even. So it is by default a negative productivity growth business, but it's also, um, it is a business of transmitting bits, of receiving bits. In other words, you get the, the information of what does someone need to know? And then you you emit bits in response, which are here is the information you need to know. Here are the mental models you need. Here are the um, you know when you take a test, you're basically saying you're basically telling your teacher here are the deficiencies in my mental model. And then if your teacher has infinite patience and infinite free time, your teacher could correct those one by one and perhaps notice what the what the meta level problem with your mental model is. Um, 
but that is that is just very hard to do if you have um, 25 students in a classroom and multiple classes and the teacher you know it's it's probably a struggle for them to learn everybody's name by the by the end of their uh, by the end of their semester not to mention learning you know everything about everyone's particular academic needs so um, I do think that the the idea of automating some parts of education where we can is a really good one and a great place to start is with evaluating tests. And the specific reason for that is um, the like, if there is a standardized test and it has some kind of freeform answer, you probably want that freeform answer to be something where you don't even really need AI. You need something closer to like a regular expression that searches for the right terminology plus a grammar checker because it's, um you know, these essays, they're not going to be great essays. They're not going to be great works of literature. Um, you know, it's a it's a tragedy if someone did write some amazing masterpiece that they just sent off to the uh, the 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 graders and then it was thrown in the trash afterwards and they got a nice grade. But you actually want a pretty standardized grading rubric because you aren't really testing for standardized tests. You're not trying to test for their maximum upside. You're trying to fit them into a pretty well understood distribution, and so it is a lot closer to a box checking exercise. And the the LLMs are not necessarily going to be as good as the best human beings at reading a text and comprehending it, but they are probably more consistent than the average person at reading, you know, reading a list of here are the the 10 things that make an answer good, and then applying those to dozens or hundreds or thousands of separate answers. Like eventually it gets kind of exhausting. And eventually people probably, I think I'm sure there are some little variances in in grading behavior based on things like time of day and the the mood of the grader and so on. And so, yeah, if you have the LLM, which again is like disconnected from time and space, doesn't have any real concept of these things other than what's put in its initial prompt telling it, you know, here's what day it is, here's what your knowledge cutoff is, et cetera. Um, that, that probably makes the grading fairer and more consistent and it definitely makes it faster and cheaper. So if, um, if education, if, if there is some part of education that can actually get faster and cheaper, that's an incredible accomplishment because in general education, at least in the U.S., stays at a kind of mediocre level outside of elite schools, and then um, and and I guess like outside of elite schools and weird experiments, some of which will hopefully scale a lot and you know totally change this debate. But like the rest of it, it it kind of gets worse. It becomes a worse and worse value for the money over time, and that's really unfortunate because. Um, we we do have an increasingly knowledge based economy. Um, obviously, physical physical things are really important, but you know a lot of um, a lot of economic growth. It's it's not about creating new atoms; it's about creating new arrangements of those atoms. And so that is that is fundamentally an information problem. And so the the early information transmission mechanism of education is very important for that. Um, and I th but I think the real the real upside from AI in education is um, what I referenced earlier: this idea of the infinitely patient and almost infinitely well-informed teacher who is trying to zero in on exactly what a given student doesn't understand to get them caught up. Um, I think if you have that, you have, um, you have two benefits, one of which is just the student who's having trouble, they spend a little bit less time struggling and a little bit more time learning the next thing. And the other is the more you've customized your education, the more you are um, allowing people to move at their own pace. And I think it is like, it's a huge sunk cost that people who are capable of working at higher grade levels are stuck waiting for their, waiting for the slowest of their classmates to catch up. Um, you know, that's like, you know, it's, it's a nice egalitarian thing to do, but it's also really stupid, especially in fields where they're very, where success is very indexed to fluid intelligence. Just, you know, how fast does your brain move? How fast can you make connections? If you have a combination of um, success is very cute, very skewed to that. Plus there's just a lot of information you need to absorb. So something like math or physics, you can get to the point where um, unless you spend literally all of your, like you could, you could imagine a a like society getting to the point where the people who are going to study math and physics they have to work on that full time all the time that's the only thing they do if they have any hope of learning what the open questions are the very cutting edge of things before their fluid intelligence peaks and starts to decline so um, if you can get like slightly more years of peak fluid intelligence applied to the relevant knowledge then you get these very nonlinear social benefits and I think it's a tragedy to waste that. That um, it's hard to hard to hard, hard to argue with. Um, a, a couple of things I want to uh, also talk about before we before we leave. W one is um, talk about why there's a shift away from ghost kitchens slash what have we learned? Uh, you know, having a few years of this now. 
Yeah, I think the like the big thing we learned is that um, people are adaptable. Companies are adaptable, and when it becomes untenable through a combination of you know it's like some combination of prudent risk assessment of a novel pathogen and just um, you know massive massive legal overreaction, there's you know there's a little bit of both, um, which is good. Like you you want there to be if you if you're optimizing for we will never overreact, then you will always underreact um, unless you get really really lucky with exactly how your incompetence plays out. Um, so you you want there to be like some overreaction, some underreaction, some of the time. That's that's how you know you're well calibrated. Anyway, there was you know, a time January, 2020, when it was pretty normal to sit down in a restaurant and eat. And then there was a time like April, 2020, when it was somewhere between like depraved and criminal and um, just a weird idea. And um, so we had a lot of stranded assets and also a lot of people who um, had, had um, many parts of their lifestyle disrupted and very quickly restaurants were able to repurpose the, the back of the house. So the, the cooking part, they were able to repurpose that as we are cooking for people who are going to be taking food, as, like eating food as delivery. But it turns out if you, if you don't have the front of the house, um, you have like a virtual front of the house, um, you can, you could do a lot of experiments. So you could test out, for example, a narrower menu with just a few items. If you have a restaurant that mostly serves burgers and fries, you could start doing wontons and, you know, Asian fusion. You could start doing um, burritos. Like if you have the kitchen space and you have the labor and you can just spin up a new brand name and test it out, you can test out a lot of things. And then it turned out there were some concepts where they could work in, like you pretty much needed a few extra things, but mostly a standard commercial kitchen and and um, a couple square feet of space, and you could execute on that. I think Wow Bao was an example of this, where the um, I think they need something like six square feet of space in a kitchen, which most kitchens, you know, I'm sure a lot of kitchens can can make arrangements for that. And if you do that, then you can start a Wow Bao franchise and start doing um, start um, selling people dumplings through through DoorDash and and um, and Uber Eats and the like. So there was this pretty quick shift where um, one part of the restaurant business, the, the actual cooking part, stayed pretty much the same. And then this other part, the, 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 the last mile, totally changed from customer mostly goes to you to you have someone go to the customer. But um, that actually changes things like the, the cadence of demand. So if, there's, um, if someone like Uber Eats or DoorDash is trying to manage, their, manage the load on their logistics network, they want it to be close to peak capacity as often as possible, but never past peak capacity. So that means that if they know, if they can infer that you, your elasticity is such, like for, for burritos, your elasticity is such that if they tell you at 1045 in the morning, hey, order a burrito, you deserve it, that there's a really good chance that you will do that. Well, now they have shifted a burrito order from the lunchtime rush to to 11:45 maybe they can infer that some days you eat a little bit later so maybe they send the offer a little bit later they can they can spread out demand a little bit and that did allow ghost kitchens and kind of hybrid models to to get more utilization out of their kitchen space and that's really good for their economics because they're they're paying for the people and the equipment for the entire you know they're paying for the equipment all the time and the real estate all the time and the utilities most of the time um, they're paying for the people for the entirety of their shift so the more usage you can get out of things you're already paying for the better your margins look but then as as people started actually returning to restaurants and as some of those restrictions were relaxed and you know, just some of the some of the um, some of the behaviors reverted back to where they were and then it actually became really tricky to run a ghost kitchen because you have this thing that it does have a positive contribution margin if there's nothing else going on, but it does also take up some space and it really crimps your ability to respond to peak demand. So um, Uber Eats or DoorDash, they have a really good idea of their network utilization and how many drivers they'll have on the road at any given time. They don't really have a good idea of whether the mom and pop restaurant down the street from you is having a busy night or not. Um, they might be able to guess some of that, and I, I would be interested to know just uh, just how deep they go into those things. But they they don't know for sure, so they can't do the same kind of capacity optimization that um, that they could do in a a more pure ghost kitchen model. And so at that point, you're you, if you run a ghost kitchen, there is this chance that your your low margin business will actually interfere with your higher margin business that you probably understand better and probably enjoy more. Like I think. There, like, there are probably some people who start restaurants because they really like food and really don't like people. But probably you want some combination of the two. Of you like the you like the cooking part, you like making good food, but you also like seeing people who are happy that they had a really good meal. Um, and so a lot of restaurants did shift back to that. And 
And so we're, we're kind of moving back towards a more normalized supply and demand situation. Um, I think delivery is, is still going to have higher share than it used to have. It's still going to be a larger part of the mix, but um, certainly, you know, by definition, not as dominant as um, when, when dining in was not happening at all, but also um, it, it is it is harder to harder to get maximum utilization out of those kitchen resources once once there are enough people coming back to dining in the restaurants. And I think I think there there can be some interesting equilibria if there is actually more data that could be used to optimize yield in more ways. And for for restaurants that are um, larger chains, they often should have a better sense of what the day to day shifts in demand will be at any given location, both because they have a lot of customer level data from repeat customers, but also because more more people are at least checking the app before they go to the restaurant and sometimes ordering on the app and then picking up the food at the restaurant and potentially ordering ahead and then picking up the food and sitting down and eating at the restaurant. So there's like a little bit more demand management, a little more capacity management that larger companies can do. But for smaller companies, they would probably have to outsource all of that to somebody else. And I'm sure Toast, you know, Toast does things that are kind of directionally like this, could do more things that are exactly like this. Um, I don't think they'll, I just don't think they'll ever get quite as good as someone like McDonald's will be at predicting demand and fully optimizing their kitchens, but they can move along that continuum. And maybe once they do, maybe they do find that there is, there is a little bit of slack. There is enough room to do some ghost kitchen stuff. And then you can actually have a sort of distributed ghost kitchen system where um, the, like, the number of meals eaten, eaten in a given city on a given night is not going to fluctuate very much from day to day. Pretty much everyone is going to have dinner. And that means that if there is a surge in aggregate demand for delivery, there is probably a drop in demand for dine-in and vice versa. So if you have perfect information about everything going on in the local restaurant market and it's real-time information and you have some way to communicate with every restaurant, then you could say like the, um, the Chili's is not going to be selling any bows today, but the, um, I don't know, the, the, the local burger joint is actually going to be selling bows because there, there's a slight dip in demand for that place. So their kitchen's not going to be at full capacity and there's a, a surge in demand for chilies. So it's, it's running all out and can't afford this extra stuff. So it could eventually get there. And I guess what that ultimately illustrates is like one, yeah, economy is more flexible and resilient than, than is widely recognized. We do tend to figure this stuff out, even if there is some huge crisis that changes everything. Um, but two, that a lot of those changes do eventually revert back. But three, that there's, there's still a lot of upside. Like there's still, there's still a lot of cases where gathering more data, analyzing it more cleverly does actually get you more returns out of assets that already exist, that gets more productivity out of people who are already working. And that ultimately, you know, in the very short term, that just means restaurants make more money. But in the long term, it does mean they can afford to pay more for workers. And if they're also competing against the delivery companies and they're competing against the Amazons of the world and competing in just a very tight labor market in general, if like worker productivity per hour does set a ceiling on their sustainable hourly compensation, if you raise that ceiling, everyone tends to be better off. Yeah, um, that makes a lot of sense. Um, what can we learn from the, uh, is it 50 years? What, uh, the, the, the novel? Yeah, 50 years 50 in years. Wall Street. What can we yeah. learn from the so- yeah, this was a this is a fun one. So um, Henry Clues, he was born in England, moved to America, I think, as a teen, and worked in um, various brokerage houses. Eventually, um, ones that he co-founded, um, worked for, as the title says, fifty years. Um, was really like he was in the room for a lot of really exciting stuff, and um, heard a lot of stories. Some of which I, I'm told, like some of his stories are exaggerated. He gets material, he gets major details wrong. Um, some of them are probably made up and just too good to check, but it does give you some idea of the flavor of ni- late 19th century American finance. And what I found fun about this book was that a lot of phenomena that look, looked new were actually old. Um, that there, He has stories of people YOLOing their money into call options and making 10 times their money in a week or a month. Um, he has a story that kind of reminded me of the, the, in crypto, I think in like the, it was more like a 2017 crypto cycle thing. Um, but also happened a bit in 2020, 2021, where someone would just remember that 
a couple of years ago, they bought some random cryptocurrency and totally forgot about it. And then they would check and find out, wow, this is actually like half of my net worth is this thing I didn't realize I owned. Um, there is a story, a similar story to that in, in the clues book where a guy is a mining engineer and he speculates in some mining stocks and then spends like a year mining. And then he comes back to San Francisco and finds out he's actually become an extremely wealthy man um, because he bought the right mining stock before he left. So you've got stuff like that. There were um, companies that were actually kind of similar to SPACs where people would raise money and not tell investors exactly what they were going to do with it. And then um, also like SPACs, there were companies that would raise a lot of money on the basis of these really grandiose plans. And then um, plans would not come to fruition, but they would go back to investors and be like, we've, we've built half of a railroad and that's worthless. But if you give us if you just double the amount of money you put into this company, then we can build the other half of the railroad, and then at least you'll get your your capital back. So um, that part it it felt pretty um, pretty fresh, pretty modern. Um, latency always matters. So um, Clues would brag about how it only took a minute and a half to go from customer puts in an order at his brokerage to they get the confirmation back from the New York Stock Exchange and the trade has been made. Um, now now we tend to think about milliseconds and microseconds, but at the time, a minute and a half was actually pretty good. And he also does talk about things like people um, you know, people want to be physically close to the trading floor. They want to be listening in. Like these information asymmetries really matter. So what I, 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 I can't really recommend the book, both because... Um, I have heard that it gets facts wrong, but I don't know which facts it gets wrong. So like, you know, if you're, if you are a, if you were time traveling back to 1870s, New York, um, please, please read other sources too, and make sure you don't share some embarrassingly incorrect story about Jay Gould or whatever. Um, it also, he, and this, this also felt really modern. He sometimes um, starts talking about political stuff and is the, very clearly confident that he knows exactly what the right beliefs are and that all of his enemies are evil and um, terrible people and also dumb and they smell funny and whatever. Um, and sometimes he takes that a little bit far. Like he, he, he kind of seems to think that um, the thing that won the civil war was um, bond underwriting because he was a bond underwriter. Um, so like that was also felt really modern. Yeah. Um, people, people who make money in investing often um, have a very high opinion of their own political prognostication abilities. And um, sometimes that's borne out, but you know, some of these skills do generalize pretty well, but um usually usually their their hit rate their their sharp ratio is a lot better in the things that they know well i think that's true for me too um but yeah clues clues is a fun book like i guess you know i think amazon has copies for 99 cents i think it's on project gutenberg just like dipping into it in random places and um you know if, if he starts talking about unions or starts talking about um confederate states reputing their debt just just keep scrolling like find something else he he just doesn't have anything interesting to say about this and um he's clearly he clearly has political brain worms of some some 19th century variety but for the other stuff yeah it's it's fun yeah the um i'll get you out of here in two minutes but one, one last question you you wrote a, a, a small segment about how a wealth manager has a has a podcast um oh what, yes is there anything i can learn from uh from what he's doing or or should be doing instead yeah, so this the the manager in question heads the Norwegian um, the Norwegian Sovereign Wealth Fund. It has like one point six trillion dollars in assets. So he basically can't afford not to invest in some company unless there's a really good reason not to. Um, and it does mean he's a big investor in basically everything, and so he can get a lot of really prominent executives onto his podcast. So I would say, yeah, there's a like a, a very straightforward strategy for getting good guests on your podcast is raise $1.6 trillion and create a very large index fund and then call up your various port codes and tell them, come on my podcast. Um, but maybe the other, the other way to think about it is like, if you, he, he's, he's kind of in this paradoxical situation where he is at some level, someone with an enormous interest in these companies, you know, he owns a lot of, he has a lot of dollars at work in these companies, but in another sense, He's a disinterested observer because it is such a broad index fund that really that that sovereign wealth fund, like there is no company that can actually cause outlier gains. Like I think if you if you published their annual results and just excluded NVIDIA, people would not notice. I think it would be basis points, not even tens of basis points. It could be tens of basis points. Um, but it's like that's it's such a small, small impact that he doesn't have to care about any one company. And also there's no point in trying to really sell him hard about any one company. What he does care about though, is if global growth is moderate, but fast, you know, is like, 
is above average, but pretty stable. That is really, really good for that portfolio. That is that is what um, what is going to ensure that Norwegians continue to have this nice, gentle socialist system for a very, very long time. Um, so he he ends up having this incentive to sort of bully people into being pro-social. Um, BlackRock kind of was doing this with the ESG stuff, and then there was a really big backlash, and so they're they're doing a lot less of it than they used to. But um, it is it is true that these large ultra diversified investors they they do want the world to be a a better place, but a better place as measured by corporate profits and the multiple you could put on those profits. So it's it's a subset of a better world, but in general. Um, it is it is usually better to just better to exist at a time when stocks are going up, profits are going up. It does mean that there is probably a larger pie because the other pieces, like the the components of corporate returns, most of them are mean reverting. So um, multiples they can go up, they can go down, they can't compound forever, or they just go to effectively infinity. Um, profit margins they can go up, they can go down, they can't compound forever. Um, revenue, though, revenue can just keep on compounding, and companies that have been around for long enough have just insane aggregate revenue growth. So, um, I'm sure some of you dig up like the the first annual report from um, computing tabulating recording company in the late 19th century, which eventually became IBM, and see just how much that business has multiplied over time. Um, whereas the the profit margins are probably really pretty similar to where they are today. And actually multiple is probably going to be pretty much in the same neighborhood. So really it is um, growth in revenue that matters over the very long term for equity investors. Well, growth in revenue per share that matters for them. And that revenue is going to be, um, it tends to be higher when GDP is higher. So yeah, he wants he wants the world to be a richer place. And I'm, I'm sure executives like talking to someone who just wants them to not just do a good job for shareholders, but actually do a good job for the world because the world also consists of other people who work at other companies and this guy's a shareholder in those companies too. Yeah. It's a funny uh, alignment of, of interest there. We'll have to reach out to him and see if he, he wants to be on the, on the network. Um, yeah. Bernie, another great uh, overview of your pieces as always. And uh, until next week. Thank you. All righty. See you next week. Thanks for listening to the riff. Please go follow and subscribe. Give us five stars and check out Burns' excellent newsletter, the diff. If you haven't already. 